I'm very excited to be here today with Dr. Stephen Lane and Arian Malik on this week's episode of Patient Need to Knows, Data Exchange and Medical Records. Arian and Stephen, thank you so much for being here. I'm just gonna briefly tell the audience and our listeners a little bit about you both. Dr. Stephen Lane is a practicing primary care physician who is passionate about improving patient care, public health, and medical research by securely getting the right information to the right users at the right time in the right format with the right supporting functionality and workflows. Arian Malik is Senior Vice President of Research and Development at Change Healthcare, where he addresses high scale information exchange and improved care, improved health and cost containment through the use of clinical data. Prior to that role, Arian was at the Office of the National Coordinator, where he served as coordinator for the direct project and the standards and interoperability framework. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Delightful. So I want to kick off with this question to you both. Why do you do what you do right now at the intersection of healthcare policy and data? And Stephen, I'm going to kick it off with you. Well. As a practicing family doctor, it's very important to me to have the information that I need to make good decisions and provide the best care for my patients. And this became very clear to me in my training that uh, the paper medical records were challenging and you couldn't get your hands on them and you couldn't read them. So, you know, I got involved in the development and implementation of electronic health records, you know, followed by patient portals, followed by interoperability. And, uh, and every day in my practice, I see the value of being able to access and utilize and leverage the value of health information as I care for patients. And that's what gets me up in the morning every day. You know, it's all about just taking the best care of patients and now also populations of patients and the public health. We have so many challenges in this country, you know, delivering high quality, affordable, equitable care. And I really believe that, that ready access to health information with the appropriate privacy and security controls is critical for us to be available to fulfill the promise of healthcare for each other. Arian, your turn, and you bring a slightly different perspective, which I can't wait for us to hear. Uh, absolutely. So thank you. Um, you know, I, I'd say earlier in my life, um, the this intersection was just driven by, you know, a vision for a better healthcare, more of an intellectual vision for a, a better healthcare system. Um, you know, imagining back uh, a world where um, we, we all get the care that we deserve, but it became personal um, in two uh, you know, through, through two areas. Number one is, uh, you know, my son um, was born with the disease called tuberous sclerosis. Uh, he's got, uh, you know, he was diagnosed with, with, uh, with, you know, significant seizures at the, at the age of five months. And he's, he's lived through um, a set of, uh, you know, pretty significant um, uh, uh, health issues through, through his life. He's a, he's a very happy 21 um, uh, year old young man now. Um, but, you know, we, we've been in the middle of the U.S. healthcare system for uh, pretty actively through those 21 years. Um, and then um, I was diagnosed with uh, leukemia uh, three years ago, received uh, truly amazing care, uh, but, but also felt the frustration of trying to manage uh, my disease and disease outcomes and make good uh, medical decisions sometimes without access to the data that I needed uh, to, to make those decisions. And so this more intellectual lens of a better healthcare system um, quickly became pretty personal uh, with, uh, with both of those two experiences. Wow, thank you both. Uh, this brings us right to my first sort of discussion point. Uh, you know, in my advocacy work, I'm really helping patients every day trying to navigate their care. And one of the most common frustrations I'm preaching to the choir is, why don't our medical records go where they need to go? Why aren't they just there? Um, Stephen, can you tell us in a nutshell, uh, specifically to our patients and families who may be listening, why is it so hard for medical records to go from one doctor to another or even to back to a patient themselves? And Arian, I'll go to you next. Yeah, well, I think you have to remember how far we've come you know, all medical records were scribbled on paper, uh, not 
one or two decades ago. And it was through a lot of work that Arian was involved in, you know, with the federal government, that there was funding provided and incentives that really only got most of medicine up onto electronic health records over the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, and, and even shorter. I mean, so, you know, you think it's hard now. It was really hard back when it was all on paper and you couldn't read it, right? I mean, so now there is electronic health data. You know, most providers, most hospitals, you know, are documenting using computers. Thank goodness. That was a lot of work, I'll, I'll, I'll point out. Um, and now, in fact, there is interoperability. You know, that that wasn't even a thing 15 years ago, you know, and we made that happen, you know, and we had to develop standards and we had to develop connectivity and we had to develop, you know, rules of the road and standard operating procedures and so much work. And, you know, we live in a very digital wired society where other parts of our lives, you know, our finances or telecom or you name it, you know, they just went there. You know, it happened fast. Industries completely transformed. Healthcare isn't like that. Our data isn't the same, you know? Your, your serum glucose is not the same as the, you know, the balance in your checking account. It's just, it has different meaning, it's very complex, and there's so many different types of data. Um, and there are so many different providers. So, I mean, I really look at this as a, the glass being, you know, mostly full. You know, we've done so much work, we've gone so far. The fact that I can see a new patient who's received care at five places around the country. And at, at from four of those, I can actually automatically download their data into my record. I can read it. I can, you know, reconcile it. I can build their story in ways, you know, with information that they've forgotten or they didn't remember that they'd received care there or, you know, or they kind of wanted to maybe hide it from me, you know, like, oh yeah, that too, right? You know, so it's, it's really complicated and it's going really well. Having said that there, as you know well, there are so many holes, there's so much more we can do to, to get, as you said it in the introduction, the right data to the right person at the right time, you know, with all of the tools that are needed to make that work. But really much of it is happening today. Much of it is, has been and is continuing to be automated and now we're already moving into a place where we have to think about the unintended consequences. You know, that patient who maybe didn't want me to know that they'd already received care from someone else for this problem because they're wanting to get a fresh second opinion. Or there might be some particularly sensitive data that they don't want me or someone else to know. So as we move forward to close the gaps in interoperability, we have to be very mindful about, you know, that we're doing that in the right way and putting in the right guardrails and protections especially for privacy and information security. I think that's so important to point out how we forget how far we've come when you're really in the throes of it and comparing to other industries who may be quite a bit farther along. But Arian, what would you add to that when, when, a, when you hear someone say, or maybe from your experiences, the frustrations of, ah, oh, I went to the appointment. Why isn't it just there? Like, like it yeah. intuitively should just be there, right? Waiting for me. Well, yeah. So first of all, just just same reflection that we have made uh, truly amazing progress over the past 10 years, 15 years. Um, and in some ways that actually raises the bar relative to the frustration level, because there are many things that 10 years ago you would wonder if they are possible. Um, and now you know, we can point to uh, experiences where where they are indeed uh, very possible, um, and and then we and then we need to ask the question about okay, if it's possible here, why isn't it possible uh, over here? Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a story from being in the middle of that transformation. Um, there there are a number of cultural factors. So, for example, um, I think there's been historically a level of sensitivity to the consequence of giving patients access to their data um, from the lens that they might learn something that uh, would be high consequence for them and they would not be able to emotionally deal with or intellectually deal with the implications of that high consequence uh, information without, without clinical guidance, all very well intended. Um, as I said, I was stuck in the middle of that of that framework and a framework shift. Um, and, and in in a somewhat um, ironic way, I had done uh, product capabilities to automatically release lab results to patients 
in um, 2006, 2007. Um, and we built, you know, careful rules that uh, that governed um, which which results we would automatically release, which results we would release with a with a with a time bar to allow physicians to do appropriate review, uh, et cetera, for for, for those results. Um, flat fast fo fa uh, uh, go forward, you know, more than ten years. And, um, and I'm, you know, I've got a leukemia diagnosis. One of the critical measures that I have for tracking uh, clinical recovery or, um, or recurrence of my disease uh, are lab, lab measures, in particular uh, a CBC. Um, and every time I go get a lab draw without fail, um, there's a set of algorithmic rules in there that say, sure, I can get access to my lab data if everything's normal. But there's no backstop to those rules that says, well, if something's abnormal, there's a reasonable time for a physician to look at it, and then things get released to me. And so I was in the position as a leukemia patient of monitoring, for example, my platelet count or my red blood cell count as, as critical metrics for, for where, I was, where I was progressing with respect to my disease. Um, but all I knew was that my lab counts were abnormal. Um, and I wouldn't know the actual result of it until I showed up for a physician encounter. And, and oddly enough, where I think some physicians worry that I'm going to learn something that'll make me anxious and, you know, have me asking questions. The fact that I didn't get access to that data, um, uh, you know, caused greater anxiety and greater worry to me as a patient and made me, made me more poorly situated to manage my disease and start thinking about, for example, treatment options. And right in the middle of that experience, there was a major policy shift. Um, actually, ironically, one that, that Stephen helped facilitate um, over at Sutter, because I received I receive care at Sutter, um, that, uh, that defaulted, um, uh, you know, a major policy shift at the federal level that defaulted access to lab data uh, immediately. Um, and when that policy change went into effect, those rules that limited my access to data went away. Suddenly I got access to my data and uh, I was in a better position to manage my own, my own care or, or, and health. And so, you know, I think some of, the, some of the barriers that we have are cultural. Some of the barriers that we have are policy. Uh, you know, I think we're in a position of having uh, really good proof points that uh, some of the attributes that we really want as patients to get access to our own data to have our data flow between uh, different settings of care uh, in order to provide us better care and better health, they're possible, they're achievable. We have good proof points um, that, that, uh, that they can happen. And we also have good proof points that they improve the quality of care. And now we're sort of anxiously and, and impatiently uh, pushing the US healthcare system to more universally make those things uh, uh, available, which is frustrating, but it's also a tremendous improvement over the state of play you know, 10 or 15 years ago where we didn't even know if these things were possible. You bring up so many points that resonate. There's definitely a culture shock that we went through when all of the information blocking rules and cures rules and this new policy landscape where patients should be getting access and more real-time access to their health information and, and how do we do that? And there's definitely adjustments in the communication of expectations and what do patients do and the choice and knowing that there may be more data available, but I have seen so many positive reports and examples from patients and families and care partners and advocates who on a Friday maybe had a test and instead of waiting Saturday and Sunday um, till maybe the following week, they were able to get access. They were able to start asking questions. They were able to start processing the emotions and going through the motions of what this means and writing down questions and really coming up almost with a business strategy for their next appointment as to how to approach it. Um, and similarly, I always give the example of um, this culture change is hard um, because no one wants the patient to be left alone with a challenging a result or a, a catastrophic result. But I routinely over my years of advocacy have also seen patients open bills that have come in the mail where they're home alone and open a bill that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, something they cannot afford. And it's a catastrophic shock. And we're not doing anything to limit billing. Billing is flowing. 
Um, we need to find more supports to support those patients in the same way that we need to change the way things that we used to always do to support patients in how they get their data, how they deal with the data, and how we strengthen that doctor-patient relationship. You know, Grace, let me, let me chime in on something here, which is, you know, it's wonderful that we can make policy at the state and federal level and a date will come on the calendar and suddenly, you know, the vast majority of the industry will shift in its behavior and things really happen. Um, as a physician, you know, interacting with physicians uh, and other healthcare providers, things don't happen like that on a date. It's not like, you know, a date comes and goes and suddenly everybody has a new worldview. Um, I can tell you I interact with tremendous numbers of clinicians who continue to have real concerns about, you know, the impact of open data access on patients and who really believe in the value that they bring to their patients in contextualizing, explaining, planning, et cetera. Um, so that's real too. Uh, and it's important to remember that. And I think that we're at this point of, of kind of a friction uh, that's been introduced in the provider patient relationship around this. And frankly, even though a federal law has gone onto the books, you know, state laws sometimes contradict that uh, and, and overrule it in certain situations. And, and individual organizational policies don't always reflect the same understanding of, of rules and regulations that Arian and I may have since we've been involved in making the sausage. Uh, you know, so there's, there's a real diversity out there in terms of what people may be experiencing from different members of their, their care community, from different organizations. Uh, there are all kinds of issues around pediatric data, you know, now, now reproductive health data, mental health data, adolescent data, data on, you know, adults who have proxies, maybe have limited capacity. There's so much complexity here. And truly, I believe everyone is trying to do the right thing, but it's not completely clear what that right thing is uh, in all cases. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think those are all excellent points. And it starts to point to, well, what's the framework for sharing data and the exchange of data? You mentioned interoperability and connectivity and SOPs. And I have had the privilege as a, as a patient, as an advocate, as a care partner to work on some pretty cool task forces and work groups. And I have learned tremendously from you both and the amazing members of these work groups. But when I talk to patients and families, or maybe I'll write a blog on my website or post something, they're like, what the heck is high tech? What are all these abbreviations? What is on deck? What is USCDI? What is ISA? So um, Stephen, would you start um, and kind of help fill in the gaps, at least um, in a nutshell, of what some of these abbreviations are? Pick, pick your acronym. Which ones do you want to start Let's with? Start with high list. tech. What is high, high tech? tech. HITECH is the Health Information Technology Advisory Committee. It is the committee that uh, is, is made up of, of appointees uh, who help to advise uh, our federal government on how to manage health information technology issues. It lives within the Department of Health and Human Services, within their office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. And Arian and I both have the pleasure uh, of serving on that, uh, on that committee and have for quite some time. Um, HITECH has a number of work groups and task forces that it sponsors, uh, including one, uh, some that really are very impactful in terms of advancing interoperability Operability of health data in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say tag your it, Arian. Tell us about <laughs> ISA. Great. Um, so, so first of all, I just want to go back to this notion of an advisory committee. I think we're all we, we've all gotten experience now with advisory committees with vaccine approvals. Um, so there's an advisory committee that's set up under FDA for vaccine approvals and one that's set up under, under CDC for making recommendations for uh, vaccine treatment on a national basis. Um, uh, Somewhat, um, somewhat lower time urgency, but similar consequence uh, is this advisory committee that we sit on that makes recommendations relative to technology deployment for healthcare to, to drive a better, a better U.S. healthcare system. So, for people for whom the term advisory committee sort of scratches, uh, you know, a, a little trigger in the back of their head, um, um, very similar functions. Um, let, let me let me go let me go uh, a couple steps back before I dive into the ISA. Okay. So, um, as a healthcare system, um, 
we want information to flow uh, appropriately and seamlessly um, without special efforts or without, you know, without people having to go chase down records and copy and fax things um, in the same way that uh, when I want to go get banking information, um, you know, I've got a banking app that can just pull that information or, you know, if I want to shop or, or, you know, access my credit card information, you know, I've got, I've got capabilities of doing that. Or, you know, even more basically, if I want to make a phone call um, and I'm on my mobile phone, I type in somebody's number or pull it up in an address book and lo and behold, it makes the phone call. And, and that's a little bit of a miracle. And that miracle uh, of, of making a phone call um, is enabled through um, agreements that bind technology together so that people don't have to do special effort um, to, to make that technology work together. So, you know, your phone company and my phone company don't have to have special agreements about how phone calls transit your mobile phone maker and my mobile phone maker don't have to have special agreements about how all that stuff happens. Um, those agreements are enshrined in common agreements for how the technology works and how uh, data is transmitted between different networks, between different businesses, between different devices. Those agreements are called standards. Um, and when we do standards well, they reduce the effort that technology makers have to get information to flow on our behalf. Um, and they increase the availability of the goods of that information flow, my ability to make phone calls to anybody I want to, uh, my ability to download my financial data and, and you know, uh, have control over it. Or you know, as, a, as another example, when I when I have solar put on my roof, there's a standard for how my my energy company has to make uh, energy usage data available uh, so that I can take that and shop it for a quote for for solar. And all that's enabled by standards. What we want in the U.S. healthcare system is a way to make those agreements about standards um, in ways that the technology vendors, the the technology that we all use can build into their products so that we get the goods of interoperability. Um, the ISA is, uh, the, the, uh, is, a, is a standards advisory document um, that makes, that, that's a publication that ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, uh, makes available um, that lists what are the best available standards um, for use by uh, all of the health information technology vendors out there to make those goods of interoperability, the improved care, the improved health, the information that flows uh, appropriately where we need it uh, available. So think about it as the directory of the best available standards that people can use. And, and then the second, the second thing that we're trying to get to as a country is to have the uplifts, these these changes that Stephen mentioned, these you know these cultural shifts and interoperability shifts to happen less in the form of tectonic upheavals every three years that you know cause the switch to be to be thrown all at once and drive massive cultural change, and more to be the way that we're used to in technology in you know in our consumer technology lives as a set of gradual changes. Um, that don't feel quite as tectonic, but where over three years we go, wow, I can suddenly stream video uh, and watch anything that I want to on my phone, you know, no matter where I am. Um, so that's what we want, we're trying to get to as a healthcare system. And the ISA is, uh, is one of those mechanisms for, for getting there. And again, think of the ISA as the directory of the best available standards. Thank you so much. I love the example of even placing a phone call and you, I guess, see how much we take for granted and not having a special heavy lift and how far we've come. Um, as we talk about standards, Stephen, can you tell me where, who makes standards and where do they come from? Well, actually, Arian probably could answer that better than I can because he's been doing this for longer than I have. And, and Arian, would you mind? 
Uh, sure, sure. So, you know, the best answer for who makes standards is the, 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 the organizations that need to build the goods of interoperability into their products. And, you know, ideally standards are made by the people who are trying to get to that, the, you know, as I said, the goods of, of interoperability um, are, are made by the folks who are, who are actually trying to make this stuff work. Um, standards are um, uh, standards are often done through standards development organizations. Um, so every time every time two technology vendors come together, um, there's the you know you could imagine nefarious things happening. You could imagine you know two technology vendors could get together and design their standards in ways that that limit um, that limit interoperability or drive to to you know nefarious business outcomes and that kind of thing. Um, and so standards development organizations are common rules that those technology vendors and the critical stakeholders for interoperability come together and agree that uh, this is how they're going to share information. Um, this is how they're going to make sure that if there's intellectual property rules or rights that one organization has, that there's there's disclosure for that. You know, in the past, you would find standards that were that were released uh, that were were actually kind of somebody sneakily embedded uh, intellectual property rights into the standard, so that every time somebody used the standard, they had to pay uh, they had to pay to use that standard. Um, and, and so the the standards development organizations are organizations that come together with common rules and frameworks for how we get this job done of of getting the goods of interoperability. Perfect. Well, and then to just to add to that, and, and then the way those standards get translated into real world use is often through rulemaking uh, by by typically the federal government, uh, whether it's the Federal Trade Commission or, you know, in the case of healthcare, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, where where the FDA or HHS or some other federal organization will say, you know, in order to participate in this program, in order to get paid by Medicare, in order to, you know, whatever it is, you must utilize this published standard. So the standard, so the, the, the stakeholders come together through the standards development organizations, they make the standards, they continually iterate those standards as technology and the needs of society advance. And then the policy points back to those standards to assure that folks like, like me in the trenches taking care of patients patients are actually utilizing those uh, as we go about our work. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me where USCDI now falls into this mix, Stephen? Sure. So USCDI is an acronym that stands for the US Core Data for Interoperability. It is the latest iteration of a standard. In this case, it's a content standard primarily. And it says what pieces of health data are considered to be core to supporting the goals of interoperability. So it, it's a US standard, even though I think that uh, it may end up being pointed to by other international bodies. Uh, and it's really meant to be what is the core data, not, not specific to a given use case or a given stakeholder group, but what is the data that really everyone who's involved in health data interoperability should be able to exchange. And it came out of a series of earlier standards that were designed to meet certain needs within the health data ecosystem. But the USCDI, the first version of that was published a few years ago. Uh, and it was incorporated, as I said, into a number of federal rules, uh, specifically the rule about the, the uh, importance of information sharing. So today, when, when we as individuals leverage our rights to access our health data electronically, uh, that the rule that, that forces me as a provider to make that data available looks to the first version of the US core data for interoperability to say, well, exactly what data are you talking about that you need to make available? And it's things like what medications are you taking and what are you allergic to and what healthcare problems do you have? And you know what was your blood pressure on last Tuesday? And there's a whole list of things that are included in this U.S. core data for interoperability. Well, that first version was great, and it really sort of shifted the industry. And then the Office of the National Coordinator, uh, under the uh, 
21st Century Cures Act, a federal law that was passed, you know, some years back that that really has helped to advance health information technology. Uh, there is now an annual process by which this US core data for interoperability or US CDI is updated. And it just so happens that the third iteration, version three of the US CDI was published today. Uh, and Whoa. anybody who wants can go out and just look up US CDI version three and you will find your way there. Um, so it's, it's pretty exciting uh, that this is an iterative process. And as you well know, Grace, since you've been personally involved, uh, it's a process that involves a lot of stakeholder input and public comment and opportunities for people to make suggestions of what should be included in this data content standard. And then there's also clearly a need for us to not only say what data classes or data elements are included, but really what is the underlying supporting technology, getting back to what Arian was discussing about the ISA, uh, insofar as it, it doesn't do any good to say, you know, you can exchange data about somebody's shoe size, you know, if you don't say, well, is that European shoe size or American shoe size, or are you taking, you, you know, a ruler and measuring the size of the foot, you know, that you need to have a standard to define the data that's going to be exchanged even if you've already agreed on what data element you're talking about. So our work in advancing the US CDI has looked both at what data elements need to be exchangeable, and for most of those, what data standards will be used to make sure that that works. Whew. Our timing was impeccable. Uh, we didn't plan this, but it really lined up very nicely. So Arian, I'm gonna bring the next question to you. Um, from the patient and care partner perspective, what is the biggest policy change or policy update that patients and families and consumers really should know about in 2022? Well, thank you for that. Um, well, first of all, um, I, 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 I actually want to go back to the future on, on this on this question and just remind everybody that um, that uh, HIPAA, which I think for the last three years we've we've thought had something to do with uh, with vaccines. Um, <laughs> Uh, ha outlines a set of rights and obligations um, for information sharing. And in particular, uh, since the incarnation of HIPAA in, I want to say 1987, but I'll, I'll have to go back and relook at the, at the history here. It's been a, it's been a long time. Um, HIPAA has provided the right to access. Um, so, uh, and and boy, there's a lot of there's a lot of geeky detail in in there. But but basically, that right is any of the information that is about you that was used that is used or could be used to make a care decision about you. You have the right to access, um, and and that is a fundamental right that is built into uh, into into U.S. law at a federal level. It's a it's what's called a floor right, which means that uh, that you know states can give you more rights, but they can't take away that fundamental right that you have to to access. Um, and that right to access has been strengthened uh, over time. So uh, that right to access is um, is to uh, what are what are called sort of in you know in the weeds covered entities, um, and those are typically healthcare provider organizations or healthcare providers uh, that provide care. Uh, and for for sort of funny historic reasons, are, are healthcare provider organizations that that bill for care. Um, and, and we will not get into all of the weeds as to as to why that's the why that's the trigger condition. Um, but we've we've broadened the access, so you know some intermediaries. Uh, who who carry data also need to provide that same right to access. And then we have also broadened the scope of that data access and we've increased um, the access to electronic information. So one of the most important policy shifts that has been made is that historically that right to access was 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 originally created in the paper based worlds where records were were on paper charts, and we're exercising my right to access. Um, 
has meant that I had to, you know, somebody had to go physically make copies on paper of my chart. Um, and that took time. And so, you know, originally there was a reasonable time limit to be no more than 45 days to be able to exercise my, my right to access. Um, sometimes people look, looked at that as a target date, 45 days, but no, I mean, the, the policy framework has been uh, no more than, than that time. Um, and over time, um, the, uh, the U.S. federal government has, has put important guidance around the exercise of the right to patient access, um, in particular to say, look, if you can deliver it faster, you need to. <laughs> um, and then in particular, where data are available electronically and where the format that the patient is requesting access to is available electronically, um, you need to provide the data um, electronically um, it, it, when the patient requests. And the, the next broadening of that has been the, the enshrinement in the regulatory framework that Stephen Stephen talked about the, the stuff that's built into programs and rules that you know sort of that bind provider organizations, or they voluntarily agree to to meet you know to meet other payment obligations that they have for uh, for CMS as the largest payer in the country. Um, we have made access to data appropriate access to data available through APIs. And as we've done that, we've interpreted the HIPAA right to access as requiring that I, as a patient, when I make uh, a request to access to that data using the standard API that we've made available, um, provider organizations have to give me that data, and they have to give it give me that data when I when I made uh, when I made access uh, when I made that access rights. And then the last big policy shift. Um, is was Congress in what's called the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, which is a broad, you know, sort of healthcare improvement uh, and, and innovation act that covered a lot of things from, you know, pharmaceutical drug development and, and you know, a, a whole bunch, it's a pretty big uh, beefy bill to modernize how we, how we improve uh, healthcare. Uh, that's the 21st Century Cures moniker. But one of the things that 21st Century Cures outlined was, uh, making it clear that that access is um, is to all data, uh, and so even though um, even though HIPAA from the very beginning has has mandated access to uh, all of the the data about me that's used to make care decisions, from the perspective of electronic access, twenty first century cures said. Yeah, that electronic access needs to be for all of the data, and you know when you when you trace through all these consequences and these expansions that we've noted, my right to patient access to electronic data um, becomes broadened to yeah, I have the right to electronically access all of the data about me, uh, following my HIPAA right to access, and and you know tying the thread through the earlier discussions we were having on standards and why they're why they're so important. Um, as we've expanded the amount of data that's available via standards, um, and as, as we've enabled standards for API-based access um, to data, um, we've been able to put these policy expansions in place that broaden um, or, or not even broaden the HIPAA right to access because the HIPAA right to access is, is already very, very broad that have made that HIPAA right to access easier for me as a patient to accomplish um, and faster for me as a patient to accomplish. So, you know, I think that's the big, that's the big policy news that we as patients need to, to know and be aware of is A, we've had this right to access for a long time, decades, many decades, um, and B, that we've broadened that right to access to encompass electronic data, and we've made the right to access uh, more timely uh, through the use of standards over time. And, and Grace, I'll just add to that. Um, 
you know, you talked about what's the exciting news in 2022, right? So we were talking about the requirement to share information, to not block the access to information. We were talking about the US CDI version one as defining that data to which individuals have a right to access using electronic means. Uh, the, the big news that's coming now in just a couple of months uh, in early October is that expansion of the scope that Arian was referring to. So, so the first iteration of the information sharing imperatives was limited to the, the content defined in the US core data for interoperability version one. And as of October, it is again that all of the uh, health data that is maintained about you electronically uh, is, is must be made available uh, in both uh, format that a computer could understand and ingest. So what they call machine readable data, as well as in a format that, that a human being could read and uh, and understand. So that that's a big change that's coming in October. I, I want to clarify for for uh, just for posterity that I was a decade off on HIPAA it was 96 um, when HIPAA was signed as a as a law by by uh, by Congress um, and and but still it's, it, it has literally been decades that we've had the right to access grace one more thing I think you mentioned uh, billing as a as a high consequence and I love the analogy of yeah that, that's a life-changing getting a getting an expensive bill is a life-changing event and yet somehow we're less concerned about patients receiving uh, really expensive bills than we are with with patients receiving high consequence diagnosis. Um, one of the other, other major policy changes that, is, that has happened um, is, the, is the right to access data in machine readable format for uh, price transparency. Um, sadly, uh, we don't have as much interoperability um, and standards around the formats for price transparency. Um, but uh, but over time, we have broadened the right to patients to access, you know, the, the rate sheets um, that underlie uh, pricing decisions uh, for major procedures. And, and there are aggregators now, there are, there are technology companies that are coming now and reading some of that data and trying to interpret it um, to, make, to make decisions on behalf of patients. But we as patients have the right to ask our provider organizations for that transparent access to uh, to pricing. And those provider organizations have the obligation to uh, provide it in ways that are that are uh, that are human readable and machine readable um, so that we as patients can get access to it. So uh, really important expansions of uh, many of our uh, fundamental rights as patients. Another add-on to the earlier comments, Arian was talking about what are what they call the covered entities under the HIPAA rules, uh, and he mentioned providers and he mentioned what are called health data clearing houses. But the other the other major uh, one is payers. Mm -hmm. So insurance companies are also uh, subject to HIPAA uh, and uh, and therefore must make your data available to you upon request. This is all so important. Thank you so much because no, there's no course on being a professional patient. It's it's a drag and drop in system and you got to figure it all out. So you meticulously put all the pieces of the puzzle together uh, so beautifully, which I'm so grateful for. So we've accomplished a lot, but there's still work to do. And I want to wrap up on this question for your guidance and advice. If patients and families wanted to know more or wanted to actually participate in standards development or some of the policy work or initiatives that we've described here, where should they start? Where do they begin on looking for ways to participate? Grace, I would invite you to answer that question since it's what you do for a living. Uh, you have been personally amazing at getting yourself involved in these initiatives, you know, representing the patient voice and the priorities of patients and caregivers. So uh, I don't think either one of us would do nearly as good a job at, at answering your question as you would. You know, it's interesting. I think, thank you so much. I think it, it has come for me from my advocacy work in trying to understand the rules and regulations. My background is science, so I don't know all the policies. I don't know about vendors and implementation and all these things. So it was a matter of reading and I landed on the high tech meetings on the calendar and started joining because there is yeah, these are public meetings. You can dial in and you can listen and you can comment and you can ask questions and you can read the notes and you can read the uh, listen to the recordings. So those for me as an advocate, 
uh, have been instrumental. And then really expanding my network of people who were so welcoming in following up on my questions afterwards, really building a new network of people that I could turn to when I ran into issues in my advocacy work. So that would be my recommendation, but I certainly don't know all of the different avenues. And I'm curious what, what other avenues would there be? Sure. I, I, let me, let me articulate maybe a few of them um, that are, that are short of getting, you know, directly involved in standards development, which I think if you're a patient advocate and you have the time and energy to do, um, there are avenues that make, for example, membership in, in HL7, which is one of the major standards development, you know, available for you. Um, you can you can attend and listen to all of the federal advisory calls um, and actually make public comment um, be, because that's a that's a right that you have as a citizen. But something very um, very down to earth that you can do is be a good advocate for your right to your rights and your right to access. Um, and, uh, you know, be a good persistent advocate for your right to access, ask for your electronic health records, um, uh, you know, ask for the data about you that's being made for, uh, being made for your, your decisions, uh, or, or care decisions, uh, about you or about your, your, uh, you know, your dependent or your guardian or, or, uh, you know, a, a family member that you're, you're helping to navigate care on behalf of. And then, um, Talk to your talk to your lawmakers. Uh, talk to your local member of Congress um, about the healthcare system that you desire to to live in. I think you'd be surprised how open um, your member of Congress is to you know hearing your desire to live and work in a better a better U.S. healthcare system. Um, I think you'd be surprised to hear that when all of these arcane rules are being that we that we talk about are being made. That there's a federal comment period, and that in fact you can go and make comments um, on, on these rules. Now, the, the 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 dark arts of this, you have to know you have to know when the comment period is, and you have to know how to how to make those comments in ways that are that are compliant with law. But like literally every every rulemaker, every every federal employee who's making rules reads every single comment that is made and responds to every single comment that is made when they publish updates to to rules. Um, and so you actually can get your voice heard. And then last but not least, um, there is a couple of mechanisms. If you feel like your rights are not being um, honored, um, there is the Office of Civil Rights uh, under Health and Human Services, uh, which administers HIPAA right to access. And you can make a complaint to the Office of Civil, Civil Rights, uh, often called OCR of, of HHS, um, and, um, and, and they investigate. Um, you can, you can now, uh, make a complaint for what's called information blocking. And there was a recent report that was published, uh, and most of the information blocking complaints. So these are, these are complaints that, uh, somebody is not making information available when they should have come from patients as, as patient advocates. Um, and so again, your voice in terms of being a good advocate for your right to access, um, absolutely is heard. It takes some work to do, which is frustrating when you're providing care to yourself or be providing care to a loved one and you don't have much time. Um, but, but you can make your voice heard. And then maybe lastly, um, there are fantastic patient advocacy organizations, such as the one that Grace leads. And so, um, you know, uh, using patient advocacy organizations um, and, and expanding your voice and, you know, bringing your voice together with those of, of many other patients is a great way to amplify um, your voice and make sure that policy change happens um, in, in the way that it should. And I can't agree more with everything that Arian just said. The one thing that I'll add is that there are other organizations beyond, you know, we mentioned the ONC, we mentioned HL7. Uh, there are many organizations involved in advancing interoperability of health data nationwide. Uh, the Sequoia Project is one, Care Equality is one. Um, and many of these organizations, Direct Trust is another one. Many of these organizations are hungry for participants uh, that represent 
represent patients, to bring, I, again, you can always say, well, we're all patients, but, but it's a different thing to be there specifically representing the patient perspective uh, than a technology perspective or a provider perspective. Uh, and, and all of these organizations are really are actively looking for patient representatives to join their advisory committees, their governance committees, et cetera. So there, there is, there is a, a real need for people who have the time and interest uh, and are willing to develop uh, some understanding of this to get involved and help to shape the direction over time. Mm -hmm. So incredibly helpful. Thank you. Thank you both so much for taking all this time to out of your busy schedules to really uh, shape such a powerful conversation that I know will be a great resource to so many patients, families, and advocates, as well as colleagues and, and others in our network who are looking to make sense of all of this. Thank you both so much for your time. Well, thanks. And thanks for all you do. It's Thank been a pleasure. Both. Thanks, Grace.